The Edmonton Historical Board acknowledges the traditional land on which we reside is in Treaty 6 territory. We would like to thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Neowak, or the Cree, the Dene, the Anishinaabe, or the Salto, the Iska Nakoga, N Nakota, N or the Nakota Sioux, the Nitsitapi, or the Blackfoot, and the Metis Region Four peoples. We acknowledge this as this as the home of one of the largest communities of the Inuit south of the 60th parallel. It's a welcoming place and a gathering place for all peoples who come from around the world to share Edmonton as a home. And could we get somebody to approve the agenda? A motion, I guess. Elise, all in favor? Hi, Sydney. And if everyone's taking a look at our last uh, minutes of August 23rd, we will approve the consent agenda. So do we have a motion to do that? John, thank you. And all approve, all in favor? I think we're good to go with that one. Okay, uh, we're next on to my report. Start off with some, uh, I thought, sad news uh, that Rose has resigned. Just, I think uh, it sounded like too many things has just kind of piled up on her and she found a conflict of, I'm not sure if it was just timing or conflict of interest, but she, I think she actually said interest, but there was obviously a time issue. So that's unfortunate, but I will uh, accept the resignation. I'll send her an email and copy you, Catherine. But I did find that sad. Um, seemed like a great uh, person to add to the board. So we'll have to replace her next time around. And there's been a governance review that I want to talk about. I think we have talked about that it's been being looked at from the city, uh, uh, the city of Edmonton, and they did have a. I uh, had a couple meetings. Uh, last Thursday, I attended one by Zoom, and then yesterday they had a hybrid in person and by Zoom. I only attended the one on Thursday, and there's a few things I, I found quite startling in there for the Edmonton Historical Board, but um, I'm going to go through it. I've asked if I can share this information with the board, and they said yes, but to make sure that I tell you all that it's very confidential and to keep it to yourself. I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to read off of right now, uh, but I will share that PowerPoint with all of you if I'm okay to do that. And I'm not sure if I am, but I'm going to ask them if I can just share the PowerPoint. But of course, if I do that, I'll give it to Catherine. She can sit and distribute it to you. And, um, but keep it confidential, keep it to yourself if if you do get it. Um, so I'm going to read this off. So what they called it, and I'm not sure, I mean, we did talk about a governance review, but I mean, very briefly, because I mean, I didn't know what it was all about. Um, but it has been presented to the city council as of June 13th and June 14th of 2023. Uh, the implementation for the changes, there's some of them will be before the 2024 civic agency recruitment cycle. So that is between whatever from, I guess, from really January to April of 2024. And then the other implementation of some of the other things, I'll, I'll break them into two, are after the 2024 uh, recruitment cycle. So the governance review, the areas of improvement, the advisory committee should be aligned with, these are just some of the basic things that they came up with. The advisory committee should be aligned with council priorities and not 
duplicate duplicate work done by administration or another agency or organization, implement measures to enable continued alignment and effect effectiveness of the advisory committees, clarify roles and responsibilities for advisory committees, streamline the recruitment and appointment process for advisory committees, strengthen the council committee code of conduct by, by establishing a third party to manage complaints investigation process and enhancing the process for managing conflicts of interest on advisory committees, simplify and standardize advisory committee meeting and operational procedures. I would say that's an important one to remember, but I'll add to that in a few minutes. Uh, now, these are the changes that are going to take place before the 2024 uh, civic agency recruitment cycle. So this is the first part of them. Requirement for future members to be residents of Edmonton. I honestly thought that was a requirement before, but obviously not. Clarify that the City of Edmonton staff are eligible to serve as members. Standardize two-year terms and eight-year maximum. So, Catherine, right now ours is one-year terms and six-year maximums. Is that correct? Yes. So it'll be two-year terms and eight-year maximums right away introduce a standard process to appoint and select alternate members, introduce a process for non-attendance and to allow leaves of absence. And now this is the big one to me, or one of the big ones, remove the use of subcommittees. Clarify advisory committees have an advisory and not an advocacy function. Okay, those are all the ones for 2024. I know there'll be some questions and comments after, but let's go on to the changes after the 2024 uh, recruitment cycle. Honorarium for chairs for administrative activities. Review the mandate and permanency of each advisory committee in collaboration with advisory committees. Mm, not really clear on that, but look at opportunities to improve the representation of underrepresented groups in advisory committees introduction of mandate letters introduction of multi-year work plan introduction of a third party to manage informal and formal complaints procedure for managing disclosure of conflicts of interest and here's a big one explore realigning the work of the edmonton historical board and the Edmonton Heritage Council. Next steps, optional one-on-one -on -one meetings on bylaw changes with chairs advisory committees. And I can tell you that I'm going to ask for that one-on-one -on -one meeting. I'm also going to meet with Ann Stevenson. And I don't think Ann's on yet. I can't, I'm just looking at the PowerPoint. So is Ann in the meeting? No, she's not here. Okay, thanks. And the uh, changes will be communicated October 24th, 2023, City Council meeting. So after that. And that's it. So I'm sure there's some questions. I'll get back into the, our meeting. Questions, comments? Harrison? I like that they're having us or having both the HC and HB kind of relook at their responsibilities and roles because obviously we're both kind of advocating for the same things. So I think that makes sense because obviously EHC was created by council as well. So it's kind of nice that they're being like, oh, hey, we asked for this. Um, we should probably make sure you guys aren't overlapping or if you are overlapping, can you work together more? to avoid any redundancies and make yeah I, I think that's i think that's a good one yeah and i mean ann stevenson i think asked that question the very first time i met her like is there things that overlap and yeah you know, certainly so i think it's good to straighten it all out so we'll see what happens from there do you know if um ehc like david ridley has been aware is aware of these conversations too yes okay yeah he would have been uh 
in one of the meetings. He wasn't in the one that I was at. He probably went, I'm thinking he went in person on Tuesday, but, and I believe that he knew Catherine, the general idea or premise beforehand as well. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Uh, so the section about uh, EHC and EHB, uh, so was that just to, I, I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but is um, is it just to align everybody or is it like, are we joining something or kind of what's happening there? Yeah, so that was my biggest question. Is this like a merger? But I'm going to read over, because I had to read it three times myself, Elise. Yeah. So, Fair enough. Uh, and once I think that Catherine said that they had said they I didn't hear this that they said that they would be a meeting but with us both but I didn't hear that I'll read what it what it actually said on the PowerPoint yeah I was just curious about that because like EHC has has a board obviously and then they're actually not city employees they're yeah. they just get their funding from the city so I was just curious about I guess I'm I'm wondering out loud about how all that is going to work. And putting yeah. that in a relationship. I think everybody's thinking that, but I'm going to read you exactly what it says. Sure, yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Explore realigning the work of the Edmonton Historical Board and the Edmonton Heritage Heritage Council. That's all it says. Okay. Uh, somebody else, I think, said that they wanted to. David, yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, it's David, yeah. Steven. And, and Catherine, you you might have this awareness as well. But I, this is very similar situation that I think happened in Calgary a few years ago, where there were sort of two advocacy groups, and they've now merged into. I don't know if one was a civic agency, quite like the board, but there were sort of two heritage advocacy groups in Calgary, and they've effectively become one. Um, you know, with paid staff and, you know, um, Josh Traptow, you know, you know, runs, what's it called, Catherine Heritage Calgary or Calgary Heritage, Heritage Authority or whatever it is? Yeah, it's the Calgary Heritage. And the, there's also a Heritage Calgary Foundation. Yeah. Which is, a, is more of an advocacy slash fundraising right. um, body. So, so even if they did start as one, they're back to two now. Yeah, yeah. So I, but I think it was a sort of a similar circumstance where there were, you know, one group, you know, this situation in Edmonton does cause a lot of confusion, you know, including for council at times about the historical board being a civic agency of council with certain responsibilities, representing council in the community versus the Edmonton Heritage Council, which is a grassroots community based funded by the city, but they can they can advocate for things in different ways than the board can because you're representing council and they're not like they can they can have campaigns about doing it. that's not the board's role. And so it's often caused, you know, some of those overlap challenges. And I think that's a lot of similar situation from, you know, uh, things that evolved in Calgary over time as well. So um, we've just sort of heard, you know, vague uh, information about this sort of realignment kind of thing as well. And we weren't really sure what was going on. So it's good to get a little bit more clarity on, on where it's coming from. Thanks, David. And good information on Calgary. That doesn't surprise me that it's happened elsewhere and so forth. So any more questions? No questions on the committees. That one, that one shocked me, to be honest. Like that to me is them telling us how to operate. But, and that and i told them i didn't like it but i mean there's always different ways to you know to operate but i just think hey we've put a lot of thought into you know how we're split up and how we're you know do our work and now they're going to tell us how to do our work and i don't like that but that's me and maybe that comes from my ahs background i don't leave i don't like to be to me this is micromanaging but Maybe I'm looking at it improperly. I did say to Anne that I would be talking to her about it because I just thought it was kind of like, it didn't make sense to me. And the answer was, well, the, the municipal government power. 
has changed. So I'm going to look in it, and I want to see where it says you can't have committees. But anyway, it just doesn't make sense to me. Do you have any other background on that information, Catherine or David? Did you hear anything on that? I don't. I don't have any uh, further information. I'm. I'm getting it not directly from civic agencies, but through my branch manager. So um, I, I will follow up with civic agencies as well and see if, what I need to do next. And again, like I plan on meeting with them on this one-on-one -on -one meeting and I'll ask the question again. Because to me, when you make a change, you know, I mean, to me, the basics of change management is no why. You have to answer why are you making this change? And to me, they didn't answer that question of mine very well. But John? Yeah, it was just this, on that point, like when you read it out, I was kind of surprised and it sounded as if you were saying that city council decided that's a done deal, basically. And I, I had the same reaction. I mean, surely we want to split up our workload somewhat because there's some specific things, for example, plaques that would be kind of wasteful to have every decision, every committee, every heritage board person on. So it just surprised me and I, hopefully it I mean, if they're not official subcommittees, we can still do our work in a way we want. <clears throat> well, like the review committee too. Like, well, then you take out the other people that aren't members of the board that are on that committee. You have taken them out of any decision making, any input. Like maybe i've got that wrong but that's the way i see that like you take out that committee and you guy you have people like well you like ian morgan you know people that are in the industry i don't know i just think are you serious like this doesn't make sense to me but it's too bad james isn't here to see how he feels on that one but Anyway, I will ask that, ask more questions and try to, you know, give you more information. To me, nothing changes this year anyway. It's going to change before, but to me, I wasn't told that you can't have, you know, I'm going to change our work plan for this year. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Maybe I'll get in trouble for that, but I don't care. Any other thoughts on that, Harrison? I wonder um, if the review panel will be considered a subcommittee because like it's called a review panel. So I, I wonder just because that one's obviously made up of public members as well, like you mentioned, and can't really operate without them. So I wonder if that would be treated differently than like say our uh, plaques committee, our policy and planning committee. Yeah, yeah and that's a, good, that's a good point. Maybe because of the terminology we're okay with that, which I, mm -hmm. I'm really hoping we are because you take out that public content. So it yeah. just doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah. I will ask that question for sure. And next meeting, I'll have more information. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Any other questions? Steve, I see Shailene and Elise both have questions and I have, I have a comment as well. So I'll let them go first. Go ahead, Shailene. Um, for the comment about the subcommittees, was it just our board that was, um, I guess, identified? Or were there other um, advisory boards where that same comment was applied to them? It's it's all of them. That was okay. pointed at us whatsoever. I think, I think there was more of an issue with other boards or other advisory groups, but it really wasn't, you know. There was other people that spoke up from other boards or advisory committees that didn't like it. And I mean, their comment was, well, we'll just get together, I guess, informally, you know, and do our work. You know, it just seemed kind of goofy of like, if we're going to do it, let's do it properly. But it wasn't just us. That's that's the answer to your question, Shaylee. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say that I think that the the idea of like getting rid of the committees and also um, the joining us with the Heritage Council or streamline or whatever the phrasing was that they are trying to do uh, kind of shows just like a deep 
not understanding of council about what we do. I like I think the Heritage Council does wildly different work um, in in different ways. I think like I mean I think this is just like preaching to the choir, but I think it's worth saying that this is just like a complete misunderstanding, and there's just not been a lot of effort to understand, um, and that's a shame. Just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think it yeah. would help. I'll be blunt and say if Anne, you know, was here more often, maybe she'd understand. Yeah. And I will say that to her when I talk to her. Say like that, and that that'll be my comment. I'll say that so personal thought, but uh anything else? And I'm going to try to get a meeting with Anne, like right away, like next week. So we'll see. Uh, who else? Did I hear a uh, David? Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Um, there's a couple things, I guess. You know, just in terms of that misunderstanding, like things like the plaques committee, for example. I mean, the historical board is identified in our legal agreements um as a requirement of a designation by an owner that they must have a plaque installed by the edmonton historical board you know that's just an awareness that you know council is not going to have and they you know they'll need to be informed about that so i mean the need for uh, a group to uh, prepare those plaques is obviously necessary the other one that is uh similar is is the review panel of course and uh, you know that you know um the 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 overall historical board and obviously the review panel they have a very one of their among others one of their very specific roles is to evaluate buildings to be added to the city's inventory of historic resources that's you know that's one of the one of the key planks of the historical board's role here and the review panel is the technical committee that does that work and our city policy c450b which is the encourage the designation of historic resources in edmonton has a whole process laid out within it about how the historical board so there's city policy supporting that review panels you know all that kind of stuff so i mean that stuff will get you know pulled together but i mean that's sort of where you know we can certainly you know provide a copy of that of that city policy and you know offer you know any input to explain you know the critical role that the board and the review panel play in the work that the city's heritage conservation unit does and if that were to disappear for some reason or or you know like you're sort of alluding to if if non ehb members were no longer allowed to be involved you know that takes away a, a very rigorous review process for adding buildings to the inventory and all that kind of stuff so you know we would share a lot of the same, same concerns and those types of expertise and roles do not currently exist on the heritage council because they're enshrined with the historical board and and so it's not just you know i think again this is a lack of understanding of the depth of of the work it's kind of just oh those groups talk about saving buildings well we'll just merge them together into one you know like that's sort of a lot of a lot of that but I'll, I'll, I'll allude to an example a couple of years ago there was a review of city grant programs and uh our heritage rehabilitation and maintenance grants even within our department nobody knew exactly what they were and how they worked and they just sort of said well we're just going to lump all these grant program people into one branch and we're just going to throw them all over there and so the proposal was to literally take us out of our department and move us into another department just because we offered grants and you know it after some intense discussions with management they discovered oh these guys are very connected to development services and zoning and permitting and all that stuff so they kept us where we are but it's that easy that it can be misunderstood and you know so i'm hoping these conversations that you and other members of the board will start getting into will help clarify those roles and and sort of see where things settle out uh, that's what that's why i'm looking at it like harrison alluded i think to a kind of a positive thing saying yeah, at least we can straighten out in people's minds of what we do what the heritage council does and make this as a positive but if you could send me that policy you're talking about i took it a, i just in my head you said c54 or something or other but if you could send it to me that'd be great and i will bring it up with that so anything else Good questions, good comments. So thanks, I appreciate that. 
And we'll move on to the naming committee, Harrison. Oh, sorry, I've jumped one, sorry. Heritage unit report, David, go ahead. Right, okay, yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I uh, will just go through our report here, as we usually do, and give you some updates on a few things. Um, so under our designations for 2023, we've had a minor hiccup with the boardwalk and Revlon. Um, these were originally scheduled to go to executive committee on September 20th and then city council on October 4th for final approval. The owner's legal counsel have decided that they have all sorts of issues with our uh, rehabilitation incentive and maintenance agreement that we're requiring them to enter into. And uh, so we've had to defer these items to the October 13th executive committee and October 24th city council to allow us to work our way through. It was a tad frustrating because they pulled the uh, requested a postponement the day before they were supposed to go to committee and caused a lot of running around behind the scenes with the city clerk and whatnot to get them off the agenda. Um, we're not concerned that we're going to lose the designations or they're going to walk away, but they're asking for a fair number of things that are just completely offside. And, you know, we've reminded them many times that we have 177 designated buildings, all of whom have entered into this standard agreement. Um, and we, we do not negotiate on, you know, nitpicking every little clause to suit somebody's individual um, uh, opinions. And that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Uh, so um, we've also reminded them delicately that uh, we are offering them a combined a million dollars in grants between these two buildings. And the city just announced a $74 million deficit. And do you really want to start? <laughs> pushing um, those buttons and, and getting deeper into uh, council discussions uh, later this year. So we've really urged them to try to understand the context of where the city is at right now, the benefit that they're getting out of this. And for the, you know, for the sake of a few uh, wordsmithing aspects in some of the clauses, um, we really are trying to get them to understand that, um, you know, uh, they're no different in a lot of ways than any other property owner that we've worked with on designation and don't deserve special treatment. Um, so uh, I, I, we've responded legally back to them and we're working our way through uh, what changes they're going to ask for. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in the, at the November meeting, we'll be able to say that everything just went forward as planned and the designations of those two buildings uh, are in place. Uh, the Horlack Park pavilions, uh, so these are the five buildings in the park, the main pavilion, the boathouse, and the three picnic shelters. Uh, we have issued the notice of intention to designate memo to City Council uh, on August 14th. I, I suspect Sydney gave you that update last month. Um, so we are uh, in the midst right now of preparing our council reports uh, for uh, those uh, five bylaws to go to council, and they'll be going in December. Uh, we wanted to uh, get them in place before the end of the year to ensure that we tied into the plaque um, development process from the board next year, uh, because the target is to have these plaques installed uh, at the buildings in the park um, in uh, late 2024, early 2025, uh, in time for the park reopening. So those plaques are all in place uh, when the park is reopened to the public. So we needed to get that done this year to make sure that we got onto the uh, slate for the, the plaque committee uh, for next year. So we'll uh, keep you posted on those. There's no money being provided to those because they're city buildings. Um, so uh, it's gonna turn out this year that the only grant money, assuming they go forward, uh, that we're providing this year is to the Boardwalk and Revlon uh, projects. Uh, just in terms of some updates on some emerging uh, designations, um, and forgive me if this city may have touched on some of these last month, but uh, uh, the uh, more recent one that uh, she and I have been in touch with are the owners of the field log house uh, in Bellevue. Uh, it's a very well-preserved a log home. Uh, they've been interested in designation for quite some time, but um, it's very difficult to find uh, contractors who are um, have expertise in repairing log buildings um, and they've been hesitant to move forward with uh, the one or two that they've been able to even get a bit of info from but sounds like we've got a little bit more um, 
resources for them in that regard, and um, we're expecting that um, uh, they're going to move forward. Uh, they're just in the midst of getting a few extra quotes from uh, some uh, other contractors for some uh, um, repair to the chimney. Uh, there's a field stone, uh, large field stone uh, chimney on the house as well. So uh, that one seems to be uh, a likely uh, one to come in the door. Uh, we're just finalizing uh, some of the details on the designation of the Hardesty residents in uh, in Westmount, uh, or more more specifically in the Grote Estates area. Um, so that one will likely be bringing forward to uh, council early in the new year. Uh, just today, I did hear from the um, uh, Bellevue Community League uh, that they are likely uh, the board has discussed and it appears that the board is is likely to support moving forward with designation of the community league building. Um, the city will have to, they own the building, uh, but the city owns the land. So they have a, a joint use agreement between the city and the community league uh, for the use of the land, but the community league owns the building. Uh, so we're gonna work our way through some conversations with our real estate group about uh, the ins and outs of uh, the building being designated. Uh, it is part of the larger, um, redevelopment plan for the uh, uh, exhibition lands um, but it is sort of right down on the corner there so I'm not expecting any major uh, challenges and we've had discussions with them in the past about that so that one um, just heard from them today so we're hopeful that one uh, will emerge as well and then Sydney's been working really closely with a uh, the owner of a of a home that we're referring to at the moment as the uh, Bell residence, uh, also in Bellevue, quite near to the field log house, uh, a small 1912 um, ish uh, home. Uh, the owner's done a mountain of research on it already, and she seems very keen uh, to move forward uh, with um, getting that uh, property added to the uh, inventory. So we're preparing the evaluation documents for that, and we'll be uh, bringing that forward to the review panel in October. And she seems quite keen to uh, continue the process uh, into designation after that. So keep an eye on that. Uh, we've had a couple of new uh, proposed demolitions. Um, another one in Glenora, the Bourchier residence on um, 102nd Ave and 138th Street. This property was rezoned by city council um, last year uh, to allow townhouses. The proponent behind that rezoning promptly put it up for sale after that, of course, and so it's up for sale at the moment, but they have come in the door now to apply for the demolition uh, of the house. Uh, so we're uh, just waiting for documentation from the applicant on the property before we notify City Council uh, about that. And then our most recent one that had uh, gone to Council and um, uh, we've now cleared for demolition is the uh, Dudley Menzies residence on uh, University Ave. Uh, in McKernan. So um, we have also just today been made aware of an application to demolish a property called the, um, Sydney, remind me the name, I've already forgotten. It's the Kirkness residence. It's located in Virginia Park. Um, it was built in 1909 and was one of the only buildings in the area for like a few decades. It was It's in Highlands, is it not? Uh, or is it technically in Virginia Park? Virginia Park. Yeah, it's okay. like around. It's seventy three oh eight Ada Boulevard. So, oh, right. So, oh, is that is that the big brick, like the brick one? Yeah, it's brick on the first floor and wood shakes on the second. Yeah. And third, I know I that building it's well. It sucks because like I've been watching it like for the past like four years. Though you know the roof's like been going. They haven't had any work to it at all. So it's like, yeah. no, this owner doesn't care. They're probably waiting for it to fall apart and they demolish it. It's so. um, it's got a really interesting history. I've been reading about it yeah. all day today <laughs> um it was uh like the original homesteaders who purchased river lot 26 uh which is where the house is um mm -hmm. they they lived there from the 1880s onwards um there's some you know metis indigenous connections with the family they built the house and lived there for about 15 years and then sold it to another family who passed it on until this year. So after the Kirkness family, the Brown family kept it for 98 years. Hmm. So, um, and yeah, we just received an email about a demolition permit for mm. it. So, yeah, so, we, we just don't have to issue it, right? <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, yeah. 
we uh we have reached out to the owner and we've at least it's a double lot so they're subdividing a yeah. portion of the parcel off for redevelopment and so we have reached out to them and and just kind of presented you know could they think about you know an arrangement where the house is is maybe moved uh, maybe onto the other parcel or or something like that and yeah. they haven't flat out said no um mm. i mean they've they've taken like there is a subdivision application in circulation right now all the drawings for the house have been prepared they have spent a lot of money getting it to this stage but yeah. they didn't flat out say no and it mm -hmm. sort of sounds like there's at least a an appetite to hear more so we're, we'll explore uh if there's some sort of a path forward with uh, retaining the building so yeah um that's it i guess pretty much on the building updates um so just getting into the report um uh one thing i did want to um do uh was and i, I you had your welcome and you've met her before, but I did want, I did want to welcome Sydney, you know, formally back to our, our team, uh, as, as some of you will know, our former graduate heritage planner, Jared Althaus, his term ended at the end of June. And, um, uh, we were able to, um, Scott Ash, um, a former member of our team, uh, is on a secondment, 11 month secondment in the, uh, housing group. And we did get approval to backfill Scott's position and uh we were able to post that position and uh sydney was um uh, very happily the successful uh happily for us anyway sydney i'm sure you're happy but um the successful candidate uh, she was our graduate heritage planner back in 2021 and um, we were very pleased to have her back and uh, she did a miraculous job uh, surviving the month of august while i was away on vacation and eric backstrom was away for part of that as well and presenting to the board last month so I wanted to just give her a, a welcome back in front of the board and and uh, she's going to be uh, doing a lot of ongoing work for us and preparing presentations to the board and um, bylaws and all the good stuff. So uh, welcome back, Sydney, and uh, we'll uh, we'll keep you up to date on what we're both up to. Um, so I think uh, just to touch on some of these items here. Um, the item regarding these uh, site visits of heritage uh, resources that have been designated for a long time, but we hadn't been back to um, in, in quite a while as a result of our audit. Uh, we have completed those uh, now. Um, uh, all 10 of those have been uh, taken care of and we have been providing uh, checklists and uh, of, uh, of our findings on the site and letters have been issued back to the owners. Uh, just um, informing them of what we saw on site. These these letters are not a to-do list that they have a timeline of where they have to complete things, but it's basically just, uh, you know, our unit identifying that, you know, based on our visual inspection on such and such a date, we note that, you know, certain things appear to need some attention and, and uh, just basically putting the owners on notice. So, um, it seemed to go well, this process. Uh, the owners were all fairly responsive uh, uh, to to us uh, coming on site and it was good to uh, catch up. You know, some of these properties are fairly significant ones, things like the uh, Hotel McDonald, uh, the Bay Building on Jasper Avenue, Enterprise Square, you know, just properties that um, generally speaking are being looked after, but we just hadn't been to in a long time. So um, it seemed to be a successful process and we'll, uh, be doing another probably another 10 in 2024 um and uh you know just starting to uh, pick away at, at some of these uh long-standing uh properties um we're continuing the early phases of the work on uh, developing the project charter for the uh, modern inventory so we'll keep the board uh up to date on how that uh, is evolving and what sort of a timing uh we might be uh, looking at in that regard um I think other than that, I mean, a lot of these other ones are sort of ongoing. Um, the property tax um, exemption uh, bylaw that City Council passed, the Boardwalk and Revlon are our first two buildings that would qualify for that potential um, a tax abatement program. Uh, so it's another reason why we're hopeful that they go forward with the designation so we can actually get a, uh, uh, a tax abatement uh, applicant uh, in place. Uh, so we'll um, 
uh, we're, we're still working with assessment and taxation on how that all will work, uh, who's responsible for what and, and what triggers there are and, and uh, all of that kind of thing. But uh, we're hoping that um, uh, we'll be able to work that through with uh, Boardwalk and Revlon uh, properties. Um, other than that, uh, just a couple of building projects. Um, the work at the Ironworks is continuing, work at the Ortona Armory is continuing. Um, we are probably not too far away from starting to see some major work happening at uh, Peter Hemingway. I was there uh, last week and they have started removing all of the flashing uh, off the glass framing of the building and um, the glass is soon to start coming off uh, uh, the building in the not too distant future I think as they start uh, preparing for uh, the glass replacement. Uh, the pool rehabilitation work is still underway uh, inside uh, but uh, we've largely arrived at an agreed upon approach to how to replace uh, the glass on the building. It's been very complicated uh, undertaking and uh, many discussions uh, between the contractors and the consultants in the city uh, and we've basically got an agreed upon approach that's going to hopefully retain as closely as we can the appearance uh, of the uh, of the building and uh, returning uh, the glazing to its more original uh, appearance um, it was never purple uh, as it is now that was an interpretation in the 80s of, of the glass uh, the understanding is that the glass was more of a, of a light bronze finish uh, originally and when you look at blue sky with that it appears purple um, but um, the finish is actually more of a bronze so we're, we're shifting towards that type of a treatment on the glass so uh, you can uh, keep your eyes on that but if you're hoping to start swimming in that place anytime soon uh, put that on pause because it's still going to be a while before uh, uh, we get to that stage. Um, and I think the rest of this stuff is is fairly ongoing, and um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, if there's any questions, please, um, uh, Sydney and I are here to answer any. Otherwise, we'll we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, David. Any questions? I don't see any. Okay, we'll carry on. Thank you, David. And I welcome you too, Sydney. Um, naming committee, Harrison. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So we had, uh, we've had two committee meetings since our August uh, board meeting, one on 29th and then one on September 26th. The 29th was a big one because that was when we had the Oliver renaming coming coming to us at the naming committee. There was also a couple other applications. Uh, one to rename a, an unnamed park in Laurel as Mabuhai Park. It's named after the it's a Filipino name uh, to kind of represent the Filipino committee or, or community, which was great. Uh, and then the second one um, in addition to Oliver was in Missioner Park. It's a site that the U of A owns that they're currently redeveloping it uh, through the land trust there. So it was just an application to name the public park space in Missioner Park as rural in Missioner Park. So I th we thought it made sense, so that went through. And so the Oliver renaming uh, uh, application came to us, we discussed it. They are, they proposed to name it uh, Wakwentowin, which means Circle of Friends in Korea. Actually, I'll put it in the in the chat box here. So this has to go to, these all have to go to, well, this has to go to City Council, I think for approval, but that's the name that they are recommending Oliver be renamed to. And this is, uh, this was a name that was put forward by uh, Indigenous uh, Renaming Circle uh, as their preferred suggestion. So that is the name that they're taking to council uh, for final approval. I'm not sure when that's going, but it, they needed our approval before it can move forward, at least. So that was the big one for the August 29th meeting. And then we met uh, just yes, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was just yesterday. Um, there was a couple uh smaller items so one was actually a name a, a renaming of something that we didn't uh that we told the applicant to go back and look at again so it's in blatchford it was uh just a local road in blatchford the original proposal was to name it lake lane because i don't know we just thought it was like very ambiguous and not very creative or like you know they could have thought something better and it's supposed to be more like 
aeronautical themed, bush pilot themed. Um, just going to go with the airport theme for Blatchford uh, with the existing naming conventions now. So they brought back the a new name was Seaplane Lane. So we thought that was better, better, a bit better than Lake Lane because Lake Lane could be anywhere. It's also just kind of sounds. The alliteration is kind of seemed kind of silly to us too. So we approved the renaming to Seaplane or yeah to Seaplane Lane, and then there was a a stormwater management facility in Rosenthal out by where the, they're building the Lewis Farms Rec Center. So the, there was a proposal that came in for that stormwater facility. It's basically a natural pond that EPCOR needs. EPCOR has a thing where they don't want to have any stormwater facilities called ponds or wetlands or marshes or lakes or anything like that because they don't want to encourage people based on the name to swim in it or boat on them, whatever. It's an EPCOR thing. Anyway, this one they're, they, they're just calling them stormwater management facilities. And they wanted to rename this one the Michael Rawson Clark uh, natural area because it's a natural pond and apparently of course fine with calling things natural calling stormwater facilities natural areas so michael ross and clark apparently he was a, a landscape architect that passed away in 2020 uh i think he had some association with the development in rosenthal or something like that and he was a big advocate for preserving natural areas uh when you're designing new neighborhoods things like that so we thought yeah no made sense to us so we approved that renaming to Michael Ross and Clark Natural Area. And then there was a, just a couple other items uh, that were not application based. One was we're bring there's a report going to council or urban planning committee of council on October 11th, just for information, but it's just um, a report on our naming policy and how we're going to action that over the next few years. So just kind of an up to update council on what we're doing, let them know what's going on with the naming committee. And the last item was Councillor Rice. Um, in ward Ipikukanipiotsi. That's the longest ward name, and apparently a lot of uh, Councilor Rice's constituents don't like it or just have trouble pronouncing it. So Councilor Rice wanted, wants to have like an engagement, an education session kind of around the ward name, but kind of renaming in general and also kind of what the naming committee does or how it's involved in naming things. So uh, that's going to come forward in maybe a couple months. We're probably going to. I don't know if we'll all be there or we'll just have like our uh, committee chair there just to support, but that's something that's come up. Um, I'm not sure if there's any, we haven't heard anything from other counselors about their ward names, but it's just specifically Councillor Rice so far, just based on feedback that she's received um, from her constituents. And yeah, that, that uh, committee meeting was just yesterday, so it's still fresh. And our next one's going to be probably late October is my guess. So I'll have more updates at our October HB meeting. If as long as it falls after. Uh, any questions on any of those items? Nope, nothing. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve, back to you. Thanks. Can you say that name for Oliver one more time? Uh, Wiquentowin. Wiquentowin. That's that, that. That's how I think that we're. It's pronounced. And it means circle of friends. Circle of friends. I yeah, like everyone that. just everyone just having a big old group hug, you know, shaking hands, stuff like that. I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on if there's no questions, and I don't see any. We'll move on to the city archivist report, Catherine. So this month, I actually did provide a written report, um, but it's mostly just to talk about um, in the archives the. Um, biggest initiatives right now that we're working on are these community advisory groups who are working with um, various members of, we have a South Asian, a Chinese, and the, um, G sorry, uh, GLBTQ plus um, communities that are um, working at bringing in their records and informing their member organizations and individuals in their communities about archives and and how to get their records into an archive so that we're capturing a much more broad uh, diverse um, stories and perspectives on the history of Edmonton. Um, so we have a couple of events coming up in October which relate to the LGBTQ community where we're going to do some photo identification or identification of people in photographs um, just to try and make sure that we have um, the names of these people 
Um, we've got some donations in and we've been trying to get those processed enough on our catalog so they can be seen. Um, one of which was the Evans collection that we brought in last year, which is a genealogical collection um, for Chinese um, people to show. Um, it's really copies of a lot of the government documents that, that showed how they came into Canada, how they were renamed, um, and where they went uh, within Alberta. So um, this collection was used by Professor Evans and many of the members of the Chinese community, and it's been out of touch after his death. For about five years now so we've just now put it up on the on the website so people can find it again and then uh, on the other side uh, we've been doing a lot of work with getting communities um, to start putting exhibits into non-traditional museum spaces since we don't have a city museum um, so we're putting single cases with a banner um, with three to five artifacts in them to tell the story about different communities. So we're working with a number of different communities and we've got four locations now where we have cases and we're starting to put exhibits into those. Uh, right now they've been done by the curators at the Artifact Center, so we're getting some of that collection which hasn't been seen out there in the community as well, but we'll continue to work with other communities. Um, our Instagram is doing really well right now and we also have uh, more social media that we're trying to um, get in with and we'll be doing some community engagement in the insight survey if any of you are members on that please uh, when you see that talk about what you want your museums to do for you um, and uh, give us some feedback on that and then of course the museums have all closed for the winter except for school programming so the curators staff have been doing that and then I talked a little bit about the recruitment of the um, EHB coordinator, which I hope to have finished before the end of October. Thank you, Catherine. Any questions for Catherine? Okay, thank you. And there was no uh, review panel meeting this month, so we're going to move right on to Policy and Planning Committee and Elise. Yeah, so um, I guess this kind of fits into what the we were talking about right off the top there with the, uh, we wanted to talk about kind of recruitment. Um, everybody on our committee right now is going, we have the same term, we all started at the same time. And so um, one of the things that uh, we kind of thought about in terms of policy and like future planning is, is recruitment of board members. And we kind of were curious about uh, how that, how we get different board members and how can we kind of portray, like, like recruit for particular committees. But I guess if we're not going to have committees anymore, then that's going to shake that up a little bit. So um, we, that's mostly what we talked about in our last meeting. But um, I guess there's even more discussion to be had around that, given the, the news from the beginning of the meeting there about some changes. So um, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that because I think that just shook everything up <laughs> about what we talked about. So, so, but you did, uh, or the strategic plan, the draft of the strategic plan is in the uh, package or in the board package. So if everyone could take a look at that and, and relook at it, because I mean, we're all there. How do we get the word draft off of it? I'm looking over at Catherine for that, but not sure if she's the right person to ask that because we should it should be it shouldn't have the word draft on it anymore right yeah i don't that's that was what was the last thing that was sent to me i don't know if any other members of the committee have got that final report from berlin it may be that she they've sent it to to um sonia and i just haven't got through there was thousands of documents from sonia transferred to me so i haven't got through them all but i will check and see if i can find the final version of that report if not i'll get them to send it to me again sounds great thank you any questions for elise or comments thanks elise and we're going to move on to the historic plaques i've changed the name to panel Historic plaques panel. I'm just kidding, but go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, so we met, we looked at what was submitted for plaques. Uh, we split them up, though it looks like uh, 
I'm going to be sending another email out uh, for someone to take up the plaque that Rose was going to write. Um, uh, we had a discussion about land acknowledgements on plaques. Um, I believe we were going to talk to, like, reach out to as a, one of our historian laureates. Uh, to see what their suggestion was, because obviously, as we're uh, placing these plaques around Edmonton, we want to be acknowledging Treaty 6, but we want to do it in a respectful way. Uh, this is uh, this has been an ongoing conversation since I even came to the committee. Um, uh, since uh, I feel like we've been going in circles, so we're we're trying to get out of the, the whirlpool and like move forward on that topic. So if anyone has any suggestions, we'll be open and receptive. Um, and then we also talked about um, the Al Rashid Mosque and there's an opportunity uh, where there will be funding coming down for our historian laureate where he's doing like some public engagement and the idea is potentially um, teaming up or I don't know if it's like teaming up or, or potentially working together where uh, we can update our website uh, with uh, input from the community where we can start uh, diversifying our, our buildings a little more with that. So that is what we talked about at our committee. Is there uh, any questions? And you gave a deadline for the writing of the plaques, right? Yeah, November 1st. I, I was reviewing uh, what it was last year. So it's November 1st last year. So uh, unless Catherine has another date in mind, November 1st is the date for that. And you can also ask for a somebody to replace Rose, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I thought, I, uh, unless someone wants to volunteer right now to write another plaque, uh, I thought I would send an email out. Send an email. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. And move on to the engagement committee. Any update from Shailene and Elise? I think this would have been just any update to the uh, social media project. We're going to be, Elise and I are going to be meeting tomorrow just for a quick call to touch base. Um, we're still waiting to hear back from, I guess, our social media influencers. We were trying to schedule, I guess, a session with them. We gave them a couple of dates to choose from, but we're still waiting to hear back from that from them. Is that right, um, Elise? Yeah, and actually, uh, they all had conflicting dates. None could meet on the same day, so we'll have to do a new round of dates. But uh, it's we'll talk about it, and we'll get it together, and it'll it'll sort itself out eventually. Thanks. Any questions for Elise or Shailene? Okay. Next on the agenda, we're shooting through here. Uh, I think you've already talked about the administrative support, but you can uh, again just give us a quick update, Catherine, on where you're at, how long you think it's going to be. Yeah, well, because these are our internal candidates, so uh, we've um, vetted all the internal candidates, excuse me. Um, so uh, I just have to schedule the interviews now in the next two weeks, and then I'm hoping because they're internal candidates, the onboarding will be a lot faster. So I'm hoping to get someone here before the end of October, keeping our fingers crossed. Yes, that would be nice. Um, I'm sure nice for you, especially. So uh, anything to add? I'm just gonna go down the list for everyone. Darren, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't have anything to add at this moment. Thank you. Uh, David? No, uh, nothing further, Steve. Thanks. Uh, Catherine, anything you want to? 
there was the uh, the Dyed House um, documentary is is was at the Edmonton International Film Festival and is going to Design Week as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to actually go to an event with that, I'll get you the dates. I'll send those out in the next little while with the minutes. I think it would be great. Thanks. Steve, can I just, sorry, I, I just on, Catherine just reminded me, just uh, this upcoming uh, weekend, yeah. uh, starting, I think, Friday afternoon, Friday evening, there's a sort of free uh, open house um, access to the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium uh, mm -hmm. this That'd coming weekend. Um, um, and I think it's free to the public from the 29th to the 1st or something like that coming up this weekend. So I think there's information about it on the TELUS World of Science website. If anybody's interested, it's an opportunity uh, to get in the building. I'm attending, a, <clears throat> there's sort of a, a more formal uh, opening of the building that morning with uh, people that were involved in the rehabilitation project that I'm going to, but I think there's a public uh, um, availability later that day and over the weekend. So if anyone's interested, just uh, go to the TELUS World of Science website and there's uh, uh, information there. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I think it would be interesting. It's one to four on Friday and 11 to four on Saturday and Sunday, and you don't have to register. <laughs> so nice. put, it, Thanks, put it in my calendar in case I have a time or will have a chance, I think, to go there. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting. Anything else for you, Elizabeth? Not at the moment. Uh, Lise? No, nothing for me. Uh, thank you. Harrison? No, I'm good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, John, anything else for you? I was just going to ask David about the ironworks. I have my uh, hard hat and my steel toe boots waiting to for a tour. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that reminder, John. Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of over the summer and everything. Uh, um, I will, uh, I, while we're on the on the topic, I guess, in terms of um, uh, people's availability, I mean, that's uh, obviously these sites aren't accessible outside of work hours, right? You know, they're, they're shut down. So, I mean, uh, any sort of a site visit that we would be looking to arrange uh, for uh, members of the board um, at the Edmonton Ironworks um, and or I think we had also talked about Ortona Armory um, would have to be during the day, uh, you know, obviously. And so to help me, what what I'll maybe do is send out a note to the, to the board members and just sort of uh, try to field some availability uh, on your end uh, because I will need to obviously coordinate a little bit in advance with um, the site managers of of, of uh, the Ironworks and or or Ortona just to uh, you know um, they're aware they they ask about it uh, themselves so it's something that they're used to doing but uh, you know there are just some you know logistics and you know stuff like that that we need to give them some advance warning of how many people to expect and all that kind of thing so perhaps what I'll do is send out a note to the group and just see um, if we can. Uh, for example, the Ortona site generally has um, uh, it's every second Wednesday, sort of the day that you know city staff and consultant uh, people are often on site. Uh, so they're kind of on those days. They're kind of often having a lot of people wandering through the through the project and stuff. So those are probably good days to kind of look at. And those are Wednesdays, for example, that they tend to do that. So I'll send a note out to everybody and see if we can you know kind of land on. Uh, what days work better for people, but just I wanted everyone just to understand that these will be during the day and I, you know, appreciate obviously most if not everybody's working or otherwise occupied and um, may or may not be uh, that easy to uh, to arrange, so. Thanks. I think that both of those tours would be great, so that'd be, thanks for organizing. Okay. Anything else, John? Thanks. Shailene? Uh, nothing for me. And Sydney. Nothing else for me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. And if we could get a motion for adjournment, I'm sure somebody would be glad to do that. Oh, there's a hand. Harrison, thanks. And see you guys. Thanks a lot. And see everybody, you. more information. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. I'll try to get more information from Anne in the city.